The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program depending on their content. Tell you, my name is Kevin McDonald. I'm a principal engineer with Beton Consulting Engineers. We have offices in Ontario and in Minneapolis. Um, I have a bachelor's degree in chemical engineering from the uh, University of uh, Windsor and a PhD and master's degree in engineering materials from the same institution. Uh, you might wonder why is a person who is a uh, person who is trained as a chemical engineer uh, giving you a presentation about concrete mix designs and of course I will tell you that the reason that uh, that is occurring is because the manufacture of calcium silicate hydrate from calcium silicates in water is the largest chemical reaction that human beings run and that uh, often we we miss some of those uh, aspects when we focus solely on the uh, structural aspects of concrete. But that's not what I'm here to talk to you or bore you about today. Today I want to talk about the responsibility for what is called a mixed performance prescriptive concrete mix design. And if you're not sure what that is, I will uh, I'll help you out. It is the most common method used for specifying concrete in, uh, in the United States. And it allows the designer to set both a performance criteria as well as a prescriptive criteria. So if you ever write a read a specification that says the strength has to be X and you have to have this water cement ratio, those are a mixed mode specification. And interestingly enough, in other countries the mixed mode specification is going away. That uh, in Canada, for example, you have two options. You can specify as the licensed design professional the concrete properties, that you require slump or whatever else you choose. Slump's my favorite one because it doesn't mean anything. And um, you can add all of those, but you are not responsible for the individual proportions. The other option is that you can give the individual proportions and you are responsible for the outcome, but you're not allowed by code to do what is the common method, and it was the common method in Canada as well. And one of the reasons is, as we go along, we'll find out that very frequently the prescriptive specification elements and the performance specification elements are in conflict, or may be in conflict, as well as there are other things that are not being looked at. And so I have applied this in my own, uh, in my own life. And when I was very, uh, very newly married, I've been married long enough now that this would not be an experiment to run. Uh, for fear, I decided I would uh, I would help my wife out. You know, she was a we were newly wed, and and she really hadn't lived out out of the uh, outside of her parents' house for very long. And I uh, I always did some cooking, but of course I studied chemical engineering, and so I knew how to uh, prescribe uh, and, and give the recipe for a manufacturer of things. And so you can read the specification for yourself. Uh, we've got some some uh, trade terms, and we're applicable. We've given chemical recipes, and of course, it's not sufficient just to give you the uh, the recipes. But you also need to have the uh, reaction methods that are required. And you can see if you take all of these uh, these uh, steps, they are very clearly written out. And why? Because as we all know we write uh, specifications not so that they can be understood, but so that they cannot be misunderstood and misinterpreted. And as you can see, it often gives you some, uh, some guidance to the tradesmen, such as care must be taken at this point in the reaction to control any tempera temperature rise uh, as the reaction between the sodium bicarbonate and uh, sugar acids is, is quite exothermic. And then uh, we continue on and uh, we know exactly how we want things put together. And then I, uh, when I got them done, uh, when they were executed, I said, well, these don't taste very good, and my wife said, well, of course, but that's your problem. You, as the owner, specified all the materials. Uh, whatever cookies I made are the ones that you want. Uh, aren't you aware of the sparing doctrine? So that's, uh, that's what you get for marrying. Uh, marrying is that you get a very nice uh, uh, person to bounce things off of. 
Returning to the uh, the world of concrete, I said I'll never write a specification again for the manufacture of uh, of of, uh, of edible materials. However, I do write lots of specifications for high performance concrete structures where we're given the uh, the guideline of you will have this structure will last, will have a service life, whatever that means, of a hundred years. Then we go on and specify something else with very little guidance and no guidance from the ACI code. But our system is very straightforward, and I can't see how anything ever goes wrong. We have a specification that we lay out, and it includes all the details that are required in order to build the structure. You then prepare a submittal, which is required in the specification, and the submittal is a check that has the contractor and the material suppliers and the specialty contractors understood the specification and are they reflecting back in their submittal that understanding and then a testing laboratory is hired to check that what was being what's being supplied is what was submitted so I, nothing can ever go wrong and at that point we could just uh, close the discussion now we don't need to to worry and of course we all know where to find these things we can find them in the section 3300 of the AIA uh, mode specification and on the structural notes sometimes those are even written by people who may uh, they may have a passing familiarity with one another, sometimes they're not, and that the notes are written by one group and the, and the specifications by others, but we know the sorts of things that we need. And on occasion, or most of the time, we'll see a specification for strength, because the code says you need it, a specification for water to cement ratio, because in many cases the code says that you need it, but not in all cases, and some material properties. We want Portland cement to conform to some obscure and out-of-date specification, uh, C150-95, and that we have some material properties. But we also may uh, have other codes that we, or requirements, and one of the requirements is that we put in minimum quantities. So we can uh, continue, and uh, imitation being the sincerest form of flattery, we can take a look at, uh, at a specification, and we can all play the cast of characters, and today we are the uh, we're the contractor, and so we're reading the specification, and it seems pretty straightforward. We have 4,000 PSI at 28 days. It doesn't say on my note, but of course, as measured in accordance with ASTM C31 to C39, and that's a requirement of the code. We designed the structure. We wanted to have a certain strength, and C31 and C39 are going to let us check. We're also going to uh, indicate that the, you were going to cite ACI 301, which says that the 4,000 PSI really isn't 4,000. It's some larger number, depending on how variable we think things are going to be. We're going to have a water to cement ratio. And that can be specified for a lot of reasons, but the water to cement ratio, as we will probably remember, is tied to the strength. So we can set them, write them down independently, but nature tells us that that's not the way we're allowed to do things. We can have a minimum cement type specification, and we also see a maximum cement type specification. Uh, I have an or in here, although there are often ands that say the cement content shall be 550 pounds, which is a minimum and a maximum. The coarse aggregate will be 60% of the aggregate volume, and I want a three inch slump maximum. And so let's take a look at where some of these things start to give us some headaches. This is a table from ACI 211, which has been meeting today. This is the current document in the ACI Manual of Concrete Practice on a Guide to Proportioning Concrete Mixtures. And this is, uh, this is a document, if you look around, that is frequently cited in specifications. And if it's not in the specification, it's almost always on the notes. And it says that for 4,000 PSI concrete, for non-air and train concrete, I need a water to cement ratio of 0.57. Now, maybe I need 0.40 for another reason, permeability, let's say. But we start to run into some difficulties if there is a perceived conflict between those two values. And where does all of this come from? Well, of course, it's uh, a lot older than, in fact, I would venture to say it's probably older than everyone in the room because uh, next year is the 100th uh, year anniversary of the uh, American Concord Institute, and the year after that is the 100th year anniversary of the uh, of Abram's so-called law, which says all other things being equal, water cement ratio is going to dictate the strength. He used uh, a, a very different number. And so this type of curve is one that you see that people will put together. This one's a little older, so it's presenting the uh, water cement ratio in U.S. gallons per sack. But uh, this was this particular one is is uh, is old, 
An older one is the one that uh, Abrams himself published. Now, he looked at mixes that were from neat cement paste all the way up to one part cement, 15 parts of aggregate, and this was the relationship between strength of concrete and water content as published in the research bulletin number one of the PCA in 1918. And you can see there's a little design curve on there and you can predict the water ratio. Now you look at 1, 1.52 because it's the ratio by volume, not by mass. So you have to be a little bit careful, so you have to divide by uh, 3.15, but other than that, it's fine. And so we have this water cement ratio that is uh, independent. We also, of course, have the Abrams cone. We call it a slump cone now because uh, Abrams, uh, I guess his patent has expired, so anyone can make them. And uh, this is another number that we uh, often associate with Abrams and that we often associate measuring the quality of concrete because at the time that Abrams did his work, these were measures of the quality of concrete because the only, other, the only way to go from this horrible and dangerous material to this incredibly safe material was to remove water. And, you know, if you look at the specification, I, I specified a, a, a maximum three-inch slump, and, and it came from a table, this one in, in particular, that says for, ma for uh, uh, massive sections that I want to slump floors laid on ground, for example, I want a slump from one to four inches, so three is a nice reasonable number. And this is, uh, this is not far off the recommendations that, were, uh, that you can find in our design codes today. And it's, uh, it's a traditional thing to do, and you should realize that this is, uh, that table I just showed you is from the uh, Design and Control of Concrete Mixtures in 1929. So uh, there are a lot of pieces of information in our codes that are not related to the rate of change that's occurring because, of course, I can make concrete that has a 0 0.30 water to cement ratio and is a puddle on the ground and would fill this room up and the concrete in that corner and the concrete in that corner would only be separated by about a quarter of an inch without any vibration. So we have a problem that as we move along very quickly, we're developing uh, methodologies to make concrete and construct with concrete that are going faster than the designer. And so the, uh, the problem that we have is that mixed mode specifications begin to start to set these conflicts. And I'll give you some examples of conflicts in a minute, but we've got to go to another one. People will say that I want my aggregate to be well graded. Right? So you can raise your hand if you've seen a specification that says that your aggregate shall be well graded. Right? Which means that you've got an A in aggregate school, I think. And so well graded has a lot of meanings. If you don't give a number, so people will say, well, okay, now I want it to be well graded and I want it to fall within an 818 specification. That if I look at individual sieves, no less than 8 or more than 18% is retained. And that, of course, we can go on and say, well, I want the maximum density curve. And Fuller had a number of curves. His curve of maximum density was that the uh, particle size distribution is uh, on the, on a, uh, with a maximum particle size of capital D, the uh, individual size D, if you raise that to the 0 0.5 power, then you would get the maximum gradation. The Federal Highway Administration spent a great deal of money in the, uh, in the period between the, uh, or right after the Second World War, they developed the 0.45 power curve, which said it's not 0.5, it's 0.45. It's always interesting to recall that uh, both of them assume spherical aggregates. So if you see a spherical aggregate on occasion, uh, which do happen if you make concrete with marbles or with uh, taconite pellets, actually, uh, then you can use these, other than that, these may or may not give you the maximum density. But the concept is the right one, which is that the, the aggregate is not inert, right? It's all inert. It, the particle size distribution is important. But the particle size distribu distribution is important to who mainly? The installer. It doesn't matter so long as you have the, uh, the concrete the hardened property set properly what the aggregate gradation was, or for that matter, what the slump was. So we put these restrictions in the specification slump and aggregate gradation, which is a performance and, and prescriptive method, or methodology, but changing the aggregate gradation will change the slump. And so you have now restricted in two modes. I have to have your, the gradation that's given, I often specify capital D, and I have very little freedom to move. And so as a result, if, if nothing else, we get concretes that are overly expensive 
which is a disservice to the owner. Now, when I write a specification, I always use Palito's equation, and this equation will give you uh, the maximum pack packing density for certain types of aggregate uh, that most of the time will work. So long as, and it works every time, so long as you do not allow the gradation to move very much in production which when I was in the aggregate production business was very easy to do because you would have a waste pile of aggregate. And if you had somewhere else to sell it, like for road fill, you were okay. But my own, the owner of the company used to say, why do we have all these rejection piles? And I could look at the gradation is bad. And then he says, well, what's wrong with this? It's not gonna make the concrete that we want to make. We're not gonna save what we want to save. But there's an awful lot of, uh, of caveats in there, one of which is the optimum fineness modulus, which he defines in another equation that makes this one look simple. So we're not going to, going to talk about that. And some of the issues we run into with the prescriptive elements are the ones that we should try to avoid as engineers. They don't take into account the unspecified performance requirements, and in fact, they may conflict with them, and I'll give you a couple of examples. But worse, it codifies this concept that concrete is a combination of material where both hardened and plastic concrete are composites. If you specify the nature of a resin and the nature of a glass, and then you make a fiberglass, you have, may find that what happens is the interface between the glass and the resin controls. And what we know, and we can read the research papers that other researchers write for them for each other that says there's the, the three phases are the pace, the aggregate, and the interfacial zone between them. Very rarely do we do interfacial zone uh, engineering, but if we were inventing concrete today, we'd call it nano, we'd use the nanotechnology uh, application of if we had finely divided silica that was really fine, and we'd use that and we'd make sure it was in everything. We wouldn't call it silica fume, we'd call it nano silica, which they're attempting to do. But some of these problems come in, and the main one that you run into is that the water to cement ratio and the specified strength are in conflict very frequently. The uh, concrete supplier is held responsible for the outcome regardless of how it was specified. The engineer wants a submittal, but he stamps the submittal that I uh, looked at this from uh, 50 feet in a moving car and it appeared to vaguely uh, comply with what the standards may or may not be and we could get a, a bunch of lawyers up here to argue whether a, a, a review is an approval or an approval is a review and uh, whatever else you run into and the other is that it prevents us many times from using pozzolans or other materials for long-term performance. For example, 318 has a restriction on the pozzolan content, concretes that are exposed to freezing and thawing. And they are trying to protect the concrete from scaling, which is a superficial loss of the paste. The code, people will tell you, is designed as a minimum life safety. They protect the, or I'll tell you, it's to prevent the public for, or protect the public from fools and charlatans. However, scaling is an aesthetic defect. Concrete beams that have a, a quarter inch of scaling up on the surface or down on the bottom, if you're familiar with reinforced concrete design, we discounted that anyway. So we need to keep in mind that the code has many durability aspects in it that are not keeping up with current uh, nature because we can build highway bridges in the winter in northern climates that will be covered in salt that are only about 10 or 15 percent old cement, but you couldn't build them under 318 because 318 regrettably isn't keeping up. Now, the contractor and the ready mix supplier, they understand each other because they can talk in very simple words. I want my concrete to come to the site to set properly and I want it to be really, really hard tomorrow because I have to pull those post-tensioning tendons because if you don't put any tension in them now, they're not going to pop out later. Where would the fun in that be? So as a result, and this is a, an old cartoon, and at the time it was written, it was quite funny, right? Because you could have one or the other. Of course, today we can have, this is really what we can do. We can place concretes that are a puddle on the ground that are 10,000 PSI in five days. That are 3,000 PSI in eight hours. And you can stress them if that's what you're looking for difficulty we run into is when the owner's expectations are not met or when the contractor feels that this mixed mode has cost a lot of money or caused delays, we run into the legal profession. Brian Mather, standing at an ACI convention many years ago, 
said that a failure only occurs for two reasons. Number one is you follow the specification and it was wrong. And number two is you didn't follow the specification. Simple. And so it puts a great deal of effort on the specification. And my wife, who uh, obviously is a learned woman, told me that uh, my cookies failed the Sparing Doctrine, that if I had exercised such tight control over manufacture that I'm responsible for the outcome. And that's what it says, basically. When in doubt, follow the specification. You are building what the owner wants, not what you want. And so if this is your idea of a Calvinist chair, uh, this is an external reinforced uh, chair, of course, you can get lots of, uh, lots of work done. Where we often end up with problems is that the owner has unwritten expectations and requirements. The slabs aren't going to, the, there's not going to be excessive shrinkage cracking. There's not going to be excessive curling. There's not, there's going to look beautiful and it's going to last forever. Now we changed that a little bit, but I once asked a structural engineer, what's the expected lifetime of a concrete foundation? Expecting to hear some reasonable number and what is told forever. I thought that that's a, that's a very optimistic number. And, and it does occur, these are, uh, pardon me for the not high quality uh, slides, but you can see the cracks that are occurring in this uh, suspended slab. And the uh, suspended slab, you can see, I took another picture to make sure that you can tell it's still under construction. And when the structures start to crack under construction, there's a great deal of discussion as to who's responsible for that crack. And in this particular case, the specification, uh, and I won't tell you where it is, required 950 pounds of cement, not cementitious material, you couldn't use any of that, of cement in the floor slab with the integral beams, and it got some lots of good cracks there all, all over the place. This structure is not yet open to service and is already leaking water all the way through it. So the owner then says, well, this is what I wanted, but is it what he specified? And in many cases, you can specify, as is done fairly frequently, I want the, my uh, shrinkage to be this value. And you can check it. And if you specify a low shrinkage and you check a low shrinkage and you specify a, 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 a creep in, in bridges, it's done all the time to specify and test it. But of course, you're testing it by the time the structure's done. You say, yeah, it's good enough, we can get it started. Some measure of what the volume stability is going to be, you get better concrete. Now, frequently what we do is we say, well, we're going to control all of that with the water to cement ratio. But I'll get to that in a second. Because before it gets to the owner, the concrete is purchased by somebody else. And so we have a, a, an interesting relationship. We have the owner specifying plastic properties of the concrete that then sit in a contract between the, the installer and the supplier. The installer is going to have certain aspects, of, so certain uh, conditions, right? He's going to want it to be workable, whatever that is, and finishable, another whatever that is. He's going to want it to set in a predictable way and in the way he's familiar with. He's going to want it to, to gain strength because he'll have to remove the forms and she'll have to pull the tendons in some cases. And we have one concrete mixture that's submitted and becomes the concrete mixture. We always put it in a golden frame, and we'll put, it, put it up on the, uh, on the trailer wall so everybody knows that this is you know, slab 362, the mixture that we're using for our slabs. And in December or February in Minnesota and in July in Minnesota, we're going to want those materials to perform exactly the same, even though the ambient temperature may move 150 degrees Fahrenheit. So we have some issues, and if you think you're getting exactly the same concrete at minus 40 and at plus 90, that is, uh, that is one of two things that are, is happening. You're getting the same proportions, or you're getting the same performance, but you're not getting both. And we run into this problem with our ACI documents. Some of them are written in mandatory language, some of them are written in non-mandatory language, some of them are written to the contractor, such as 301. Some of them are written to the designer, such as 318. Some of them are written to the testing lab and the owner, like 311. All of them assigning con responsibilities back and forth to member to people that are not, according to ACI, in the conversation. Perfect example, ACI 311 has a specification for the use of laboratory testing samples or laboratory testing services, and in that contract it says that the curing of the samples is the responsibility of the contractor in a document that's talking only to the owner in the testing lab. So we have some difficulties where we start to run into them, 
because we have this other advice, which is good advice, which is if you have a conflict in the specifications, you should identify, clarify. But if you can't, the, more, the stricter requirement applies. And that's because we've done a lot of things in, in engineering to make sure that, uh, that we know exactly what we're saying. So we, we, we spend a lot of time getting an education and uh, it always looks very easy when you're observing it. And we also deal with the structural engineer who requires this method for the development of the concrete mixture design, but would never require it for the actual structure itself because it always is uh, amazing to me that you can build a, and design a, com a concrete structure with a computer, but you have to do a mixture design, a mixture proportions and trial batch because the state of the art of predicted prediction given us cement and us fly ash is such that this is what we do. We run some materials through, we break some cylinders, and if they pass, that's great. And if they don't, that's okay too. So looking at some typical specifications, okay too, because then we get to do another mixed design, and lab guys like doing that. So if we take a look at this specification, here you can say, it says that the mixed designs shall be prepared by an independent uh, testing agency in accordance with ACI 211 and 318. So any uh, ACI nerds in the room, what's wrong with that? The specification, 211 is written in non-mandatory language, so it's not a good specification because it says you might want to do this, but you, or you should do that, and you could do this other thing, and then 318 is written to the designer. They really should say it's specified in accordance with, I, I can see that we have ACI, which one? 301, right? And 301 is going to lay out, says thou shalt do this, and it, what, you, they, what the designer here wants is they want the uh, over design that's required in 318, but it's it's, uh, it has survived yet again, but soon it will not be in 318. It will only be in 301. But 211 gives you about 20 different methods of mixed design. It's, it's a bad specification, although reading the specification is good because this guy read the specification that said, water shall not be added to the truck after batching. So it's, uh, you know, it's the uh, figures never lie, but liars figure sort of thing, right? And so we get these specifications as we go along. The biggest one that we run into is that we specify a water to cement ratio, expecting it to have an effect on the shrinkage. And the shrinkage is determined by the water content of the mixture and the pozzolan content. It's predictable. If you have any data on shrinkage and mixes, you can take them from all across the country. Mixes that have a water content below 250 pounds per cubic yard will have moderate to low shrinkage. Below 225, it will have low shrinkage. Above 250 to 300, it's marginal. Anything over 300, it probably shrinkage is 0 .08, 0 0.008, measured by C157. It doesn't matter what aggregates you use, it doesn't matter anything else, because it has to do with where the water is and how much extra water you had relative to the cement. So we specify a water-cement ratio where of 0.4, but 600 and 240 and 800 and 320 are both 0.4 water cement ratios and one of them will have a shrinkage that is at least double of the first. Both of them are in compliance with the specification. Then you get a lot of shrinkage cracking and curling and everybody comes back and says the concrete wasn't what we needed. Back to your responsibility of who is, what's the role of the, is the role of the concrete producer to stop the engineer from doing something that she may have not have intended. I'll leave you with one uh, with one example. This is a uh, this is unfortunately a true story. A very large builder of uh, retail operations specified a slab to have low shrinkage with a low water to cement ratio at 0 0.40, and we use uh, we design the mixture to uh, to have about 550 pounds of or sorry. 600 pounds of cement because 240 is about as low as we'll go for a slab because we don't really hate, we don't, we don't like the finisher, but we don't hate it. So we're going to stay at 240 or thereabouts. And specified a strength of 3,500 PSI because they've been told that low strength concretes don't curl as much, which they probably don't. So this, they run, the, they execute the next few, several projects, and the stores all have curling all over the place. And they come back and say, I specified 3,500 PSI, and your concrete's all coming in well over 6,000. So, well, yes, but you specified a 0.40 water cement ratio, and that's what we do. And if we go back to 
the table in uh, 211, uh, and it happens to be that we're getting the same uh, predictability. We're at 6,000 PSI. So they changed their specification, and it came out and said, we want the concrete compressive strength to be between 3,250 and 3,750 PSI at 28 days. And the salesman brought this to me, and I said, well, that's nice, but this is a physical impossibility with normal ready mix pro properties, even if you cheated and said, I'll just make the water cement ratio, whatever. If we tried to hit this strength with no, no controls in place, we wouldn't be able to do it. It's just, that would require you to have a standard deviation of about 150 in production, and it's not possible. The salesman looked at me and said, well, that, that, that's bad because we already got five of these stores. So um, we went on and dealt with it. So in other words, the problem that we encounter are real problems that, that add to real costs. And so we need to look and see who is responsible for what possible outcomes. And this common method a lot puts us in a position where we can say that they're responsible. This is in, in part, of course, being given from the point of view of a ready mix producer, but I don't do that anymore. I design high-performance concrete, and it's astonishing how frequently we can make really, really good concrete in the lab, and if you can get it done in the forms, more power to you, which you probably can. But if we got it in the forms, it would be great concrete. But getting it in the forms is an important part. So that's uh, that's all that I have to say. I always leave a little bit of uh, Kipling up to give you a chance to read it during the questions, which talks a lot uh, to, uh, about our um, role in the society as engineers. So I'd be glad to open the floor to any other questions, and not just of me, but thank you very much, and thank you everyone for attending. <laughs>